Good afternoon. I'm Vanessa White, director of NASA's Johnson Space Center. On behalf <laughs> On behalf of our more than 11,000 employees in Houston and at our White Sands test facility in New Mexico, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Vice President Kamala Harris and the National Space Council. NASA's Johnson Space Center has served as the iconic setting to some of humankind's greatest achievements. This year is very special for us as we're celebrating Johnson Space Center's 60th anniversary in Houston. NASA's human spaceflight program has seen its busiest years in more than a decade in terms of number of spacewalks, launches, people in space, and research conducted aboard the International Space Station. Throughout the past 21 years, the United States has had continued human presence in space. And we are conducting experiments across multiple disciplines of research, including Earth and space science, biology, human physiology, and physical sciences. And soon, under Artemis, we will go to the moon, and we will go in a way that we've never gone before, with innovative new partnerships, technologies, and systems to study and explore more of the lunar surface than ever before. Then we will use what we learn to send our astronauts to Mars. As chair of the National Space Council, Vice President Harris recognizes the importance of preserving and advancing the United States leadership in space, as well as ensuring the United States capitalizes on the rich opportunities presented by our nation's space activities. I'd like to thank Vice President Harris for her demonstrated leadership bringing together interagency partners across the federal government to synchronize the nation's civil, commercial, and national security space activities. Vice President Harris's role leading the National Space Council is immensely impactful for the Artemis generation, inspiring America as a leader of many firsts. She is the first woman, the first black American, and the first South Asian American to be elected Vice President of the United States of America. Artemis will land the first woman and first person of color on the moon, inspiring the next generation of America explorers that they, quote, may be the first to do many things, but will certainly not be the last. At this time, it is my absolute honor to introduce the chair of the National Space Council and the vice president of the United States of America, Kamala Harris. Have a seat. Good afternoon. Madam Director, thank you for that very kind introduction and for your work. I am thrilled to be here. I am thrilled to be here. And um, But for our director, I want to thank you for your leadership. You have been an inspiration to so many. It is truly an honor to be with so many leaders here today. I've had the chance to visit with quite a few of you. Uh, this morning, and I will tell you, each and every one of you and our panelists, you inspire me and you inspire our nation, and by extension, you inspire the world. So thank you all for what you do. And to the members of our administration, the members of Congress who are here, private sector leaders, 
international partners, and of course my fellow Americans. Thank you and welcome to the second convening of our National Space Council. So 60 years ago next week, just up the road at Rice University, President John F. Kennedy delivered an address on the future of the American space program. At the time, the space race with the Soviet Union was well underway. And while our nation had made many discoveries and achieved many milestones in the years before, at the time, America was at real risk of falling behind. And so, to the assembled thousands and to the entire world, President Kennedy made a vow. Before the end of the decade, America would do what no nation had done before. We would set foot on the moon. Because of the vision of President Kennedy, because of the commitment of President Johnson, a champion of the American space program since his days in the United States Senate, and because of the hard work and ingenuity of thousands of Americans, our nation, in fact, did achieve that goal. In the decades since, America has orbited Mercury, landed rovers on Mars, and flown by Pluto. We have looked back on our Earth from billions of miles away. And we have built a telescope powerful enough to observe our universe as it was billions of years ago. Imagine, for generations, with our allies and partners around the globe, America has led our world in the exploration and use of space. And I do believe that our leadership has been guided by a set of fundamental principles. Cooperation, security, ambition, and public trust, which is the recognition, of course, that space can and must be protected for the benefit of all people. Today, as was the case 60 years ago, our nation's leadership in space is critical to our economic prosperity, to our scientific and technological progress, and in a time of increasing great power rivalry to our national security. So the mission of this council is to preserve and promote American leadership in space, to synchronize our nation's civil and commercial and national security space activities so that America may continue to use space to improve the lives of people in our nation and throughout our world. Last year at the first meeting of the National Space Council, we identified three priorities essential to that mission. First, expanding our STEM workforce. And I've invited some students here today because they truly are the future of our leadership on that level. Second, a priority is addressing the climate crisis. And third, promoting international rules and norms to govern space activities. Today, the business of our work is for the Council to report on the work that has occurred since our last meeting across these areas. We will today also discuss the work yet ahead, the work we must still do to continue to move forward. In particular, the work we must do to build 
a skilled technical space workforce to advance human space exploration and to establish rules for novel commercial space activities. First, building our skilled technical workforce. So last week, with many of you, I had the honor to visit the Kennedy Space Center. There I met some of the people who are building the future of the American Space Program. And as you might expect, these were engineers, literally rocket scientists, astronauts, and programmers. And they were also welders, machinists, and electricians. Today, the space industry employs tens of thousands of skilled technical workers. Even so, there are thousands more jobs for technical workers, good paying jobs that often do not require a four-year degree, but are essential to our space program. And these jobs are just waiting to be filled. Last year, I called on private sector leaders to help our nation address then this workforce need. And today, I'm proud to say over a dozen commercial space companies are answering that call. In fact, next month, these companies will kick off three regional pilot training programs, one in Florida, one on the Gulf Coast, and one in Southern California. This coalition of companies will partner with our community colleges, with our technical schools, and our unions to help workers learn the skills they need to take on the new jobs that are being created in the space industry and to help our nation lead the way in space. So that brings me to our second area of focus and a focus of our meeting for today as well, which is advancing human space exploration. Soon, for the first time in half a century, America will go back to the moon. The Artemis program will return American astronauts to the lunar surface. In yes. Yes. And as Madam Director mentioned, the f it will include the first woman and person of color. And, and think about it. So when we went before, indeed with pride, we planted our flag. It was rather temporary, that visit. With the Artemis program, it's not just to visit, but to live and to work on the moon. Think about that. The Artemis program, yes. The Artemis program will establish the first space station in lunar orbit and the first lunar base camp where astronauts will train for the first mission to Mars. And our nation is also leading the way in human space exploration closer to home. For over two decades, astronauts aboard the International Space Station have advanced scientific progress. In fact, I was, I was honored to speak with three of them this morning from here, of course. Uh, NASA has used the station's unique microgravity environment to develop new treatments for cancer and rare genetic diseases. And when I spoke with them this morning, they talked about how their work is helping us fight the climate crisis. Their work is increasing the productivity of our farms and slowing the effects of aging. So our administration and we all gathered today are committed to continuing that work, which is why last year our administration announced that we would extend our commitment to the International Space Station through 2030. And that being said, we are aware 
that the International Space Station will not remain operational forever, that we all know, which is why NASA is working with the private sector to develop the first generation of commercial space stations. And as we will discuss more today, our administration remains committed to making sure that NASA maintains the capacity to conduct cutting-edge research in space. Which brings me then to our final area of focus, establishing rules for novel commercial space activities. Today, private space companies have capabilities that would have been difficult to imagine even a decade ago. Today, private companies can dock satellites in orbit. They can capture and move space debris out of the way of our satellites and space stations. And soon, they will be able to repair and even build new structures while in orbit. These novel activities will enable America's continued leadership in space. But because these capabilities are so new, few rules currently exist to ensure that they are conducted safely, effectively, and sustainably, which is why, in consultation with civil and commercial stakeholders, our administration is currently developing the first rules as a framework for novel space activities. These rules will promote innovation and enable competition. They will reinforce the sources of America's global strength, such as our innovation and our industrial capacity. These rules will be flexible enough to cover space activities that have not yet even been imagined. And they will help ensure that our nation remains a global role model for the responsible use of space. All of this, then, is part of our administration's larger vision for space. As I explained last year, as activity in space grows, we must also establish international rules and norms to reaffirm the rights of and demand responsibility from all space-faring nations. Since our last meeting, eight new nations have signed on to the Artemis Accords, which established clear norms for civil space exploration, bringing the total of signatories to 21. This April, I announced that our nation would not conduct destructive, direct ascent, anti-satellite missile testing. And later this month, the United States will introduce a resolution at the United Nations General Assembly to call on other nations to make the same commitment. And here is my final point. Much has changed since our nation first set our sights on the moon six decades ago. We have traveled billions of miles into the unknown. And we have learned many great and profound truths about our universe. And yet, in a very real sense, we have only just begun our journey into space. There is so much we still don't know, and so much we still haven't done. Space remains a place of undiscovered and unrealized opportunity. So our task then, and our responsibility, dare I say, is to work together to guide humanity forward into this new frontier and to make real the incredible potential of space for all people. 
May God bless you, and may God bless America. Thank you all. And with that, we will begin our meeting. So, Will, do you want to start us off? Um, so, we're going to start with uh, session one. And at our last meeting, as I mentioned, we focused on three priorities, STEM, climate, and rules and norms. So, on STEM, we will have a full session on our work later in the meeting. On climate, we have tasked the Council to make climate data and decision tools more accessible for everyone. And then on rules and norms, we have tasked the Council to increase signatories on the Artemis Accords and to develop new rules and norms for space activity. So I'm going to ask NASA to then begin the session and I'm going to look to our extraordinary administrator um, Bill Nelson, the former senator, who has been just uh, so compelling in the way that he has led uh, the work that, that NASA is doing. So, uh, Bill, I'm going to ask you, how has NASA made its climate resilience and climate satellite data um, work accessible for all users, from government to a farmer? Can you talk a little bit about that? Madam Vice President, welcome to the Johnson Space Center, who was as Vice President, the first Chairman of the first National Space Council. And you and the President have chosen to extend that. Uh, here we are today. Uh, and I would add one more quote from Kennedy's speech 60 years ago. He said, we go to the moon and do other things, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Yeah. And space is hard, and all of these people, one way or another, in these uh, administration uh, positions, they are dealing with very hard subject. Now, one of the more promising of all the subjects is the question you ask, which is, what can we do from space about understanding what's happening to our Earth and to the climate? So we are going to put up a series of great observatories in addition to what we already have that is going to give us a 3D precise understanding of things that are happening to the water, to the land, to the ice, and to the atmosphere. And it's all going to be presented in what we're calling the Earth Information Center. And we have a film that we want to show you about the Earth Information Center. Roll the tape. For more than 50 years, NASA has been collecting and providing data on Earth's land, water, ice, and atmosphere. Now, a new era of Earth science has begun. Together with international partners, NASA will launch the SWAT mission to provide the first ever global survey of Earth's surface water, the oceans, lakes, and rivers that affect all of us. But we also need to understand our planet as a complex whole. That's why NASA will launch a fleet of state-of-the-art satellites forming the Earth System Observatory, which will create a comprehensive 4D view of Earth from bedrock to atmosphere like never before. The Earth System Observatory will arm us with crucial data to help us address climate change and protect our communities. But how do we get this critical information to the people who need it? Introducing the Earth Information Center. NASA, working with our federal partners, will equip decision makers with the information they need to mitigate, adapt, and respond to climate change. We will create a greenhouse gas monitoring system and make data about our changing planet accessible to those who need it most. New satellites observing in the sky, 
and an information center here on Earth, protecting our planet for the next generation. That's quite impressive. <laughs> And I noticed the farmer who had the, the tablet in that video doing their work with the assistance of the satellite data. So thank you for that, Bill. Um, we have Assistant Secretary of the Interior, Tanya Trujillo, here. Last year I visited, where's Tanya? Th there you are. Last year I visited Goddard and um, saw the first images of the new satellite, Landsat 9. It was just really extraordinary. And it'd be great if you could talk a little bit about um, since then, how are local leaders using Landsat 9, and how are you finding it to be helpful in terms of the decisions that they need to make in real time at the local level? Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. I'm pleased to be representing the Department of the Interior today. USGS took over the controls of the Landsat 9 satellite from, La from NASA last month and we are looking forward to continuing that 50-year record of great Earth observation images. The new capabilities of Landsat 9 allow us to better track and understand the consequences of global climate change in order to help people on the ground operate their businesses and protect their citizens. Last week, during World Water Week in Stockholm, we heard from two farmers, one from Oregon and one from uh, California, who told us how they use Landsat 9 images to evaluate the crop use, the water use of their crops by verifying the evapotranspiration rates that they're seeing and allowing them to use less water, especially important now during these drought times. We're also using Landsat 9 to document the historic 20-year drought that we have in the Colorado River Basin. Yeah. and to see the rapidly changing conditions in our river systems and glaciers, documenting the historic floods we're seeing around the globe and predicting future sea level rise. Landsat 9 images also allow us to detect water quality changes mm -hmm. in things like harmful algal blooms mm -hmm. that we see in lakes that affect our drinking water supplies. All of the Landsat data is available for free for anybody, whether you're a government agency, a business, a school, or a family, anywhere around the globe. Those images are used in commercial activities such as Google Earth and Planet. They're also used to help our research priorities for our STEM programs and mentoring opportunities such as the Ladies of Landsat we are very excited about the announcement yesterday with our partners at Commerce on the, excuse me, on the cam camera climate mapping yeah. tool, which is another great example of how we're using our new technology and working together for the benefit of the American people. Thank you very much for your leadership, Madam Vice President. And for, for folks who are listening right now, how would they have access to some of this information? Where should they go? We have it widely available both from NASA and the USGS through our Landsat.gov programs. Never without a website. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Deputy, uh, Deputy Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Jewel Brona, uh, please talk about how the Department of Agriculture is helping farmers deal with increasingly what they are seeing in terms of floods and drought. Can you talk a little bit about how the Department of Agriculture and your leadership is, is having an impact on that? Yes, first of all, congratulations to you for leading such an important initiative. And we're just pleased to be a part of this council um, who's doing such important work. Um, we recognize that this administration has allowed us to focus on some really important things, planet-wide food security, global agricultural practices, climate change and space, and you mentioned drought and, and other disasters. Mm -hmm. uh, we have really been able to focus on land-based conservation practices, um, and they will be directly dependent upon our ability to furnish and integrate space-based data layers 
into climate conservation practices mm -hmm. using tools such as ESRI and Landsat data. Right. We can utilize that data to address a myriad of issues, uh, including um, how our land is doing uh, to deal with disasters such as uh, drought and others, uh, agricultural production and mm -hmm. other things, and it's really allowing us to focus on um, a lot of work that we're doing in climate smart agriculture. So uh, we need our farmers and landowners to have solid data, yeah. and they need that data to make decisions. Um, it's going to help them have the capability of integrating space-based data into their precision agriculture innovations. Mm -hmm. So we are very excited to be able to have resources mm -hmm. from this council and the science that we need to deal with the challenges that our farmers face every day. And you know, the um, astronauts that I spoke with this morning who are on the International Space Station made a real point of emphasis on just that type of work and the importance of it, um, and including what I know that the Department of Agriculture is doing in terms of working with NASA to develop crops for long duration um, space missions, which is very exciting as well. So thank you for that. Um, Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Commerce, Don Graves, uh, can you speak to the work that Commerce is doing and increasingly taking on as it relates to our space program? Well, thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, thank you for bringing us together. Uh, I want to start, if I may, uh, by highlighting the work that the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, at yes. uh, Commerce is leading on climate data. NOAA is, as you know, is the nation's climate agency, working closely with our partners at NASA. Mm -hmm. And we're working hard to build a climate-ready nation. So just this week, as Tanya mentioned, uh, in collaboration with the White House, with ESRI and the Department of Interior, NOAA released the Climate Mapping for Resilience and Adaptation, or CAMERA, portal. The tool will help Americans assess their local exposure to climate-related hazards and identify potential funding that can help them protect people, property, and infrastructure. Space-based technologies, including remote sensing data produced by NOAA satellites, have dramatically enhanced scientific understanding of our changing natural environment. And as you heard, Landsat and other satellite remote sensors measure surface skin temperature. Yeah. That's roads, rooftops, canopies. Uh, and uh, forest canopies whose temperature can be significantly hotter or cooler than the temperature that people in these places actually experience. So NOAA is adding to this data with on-the-ground measurements. It's our most innovative program and we work with community-based groups in underserved communities to map the hottest parts of cities so they can use that information to inform strategies yeah. to reduce the unhealthy and deadly effects of extreme heat. Mm -hmm. And I know you're, you're mm -hmm. wondering about how you can get that information. Absolutely. Uh, you can, uh, it, more information <laughs> on extreme heat is available on NOAA's heat.gov website. I also want to get back to your, uh, your other question. The, the National Space Traffic Management Policy, mm -hmm. as you know, yeah. charges the Commerce Department yeah. with the task of managing future space traffic awareness for all civil and commercial users. Mm -hmm. Space is becoming increasingly crowded, as we've seen uh, very recently. We need new technologies to help monitor active space objects and detect potentially dangerous debris. So Commerce, in collaboration with Defense and NASA, is working to establish a system for civil and commercial space traffic awareness that will support space safety and enhance technology developments. And I'm happy to announce that with our partners at the DOD, we've signed a memorandum of, understand, of agreement that will drive our mutual work. And that's really going to allow us to have not just a basic level of space traffic awareness it will also allow us to drive the research, the innovation that we all know we need to maximize the space environment for future generations. So we're making great progress on, uh, on that, on our space situational awareness system. And today we're also announcing that we're starting a series of important space situational awareness data buys, uh, including low Earth orbit and geostationary uh, data. And we're going to follow that up with other awards focused on those and other uh, orbital regimes. In addition, we're going to be uh, initiating contract processes for buying other key commercially available technologies and services from the commercial data providers so that we can build this together using the innovation that the private sector provides. This, this fall, and I'll finish here, we'll conduct an, an all-commercial pilot program that will seek to replicate a portion of 
the DOD's basic safety services using only commercial data and analytical services. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Thank you. That, that's great progress since we last met, and that was the subject of an extensive conversation at our first council meeting. Um, and for those who are new to space, it, it's, it's basically traffic control. Um, and, and what we need to do to be smart and efficient and effective and collaborative with the private sector. And I know the work that, that Commerce has been doing with the Department of Defense has been um, very influential in moving that along. So thank you for that. Um, Assistant Secretary of State Monica Medina, uh, please update us on how the Department of State is furthering this work. I spoke earlier about our intentions in terms of conversations at the United Nations General Assembly meeting coming up. If you can talk about that. Yes, thank you, Madam ben, Vice President. I'm honored to be here to represent the State Department today and will report out on all our diplomatic efforts. As you mentioned, our colleagues at NASA are doing incredible work to return humans, men and women, to the moon. At the same time, we have been working together to expand the global reach of our Artemis Accords. With the Accords, we are inviting other spacefaring nations to join in a common vision, a practical set of principles grounded in the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 for safe, transparent, and responsible behavior in space that will facilitate exploration, science, and commercial activities for the benefit of all humanity. As you mentioned, the Artemis family is growing fast with the addition of Mexico, Israel, Romania, Bahrain, Singapore, Colombia, France and Saudi Arabia just since the last meeting mm -hmm. and later this month the US along with Brazil and France will be hosting the first gathering of the Artemis Accord signatories on the sidelines of the International Astronautical Congress in Paris. The participants will discuss how to operationalize the Accords in civil and commercial context and how to continue to add to the Artemis family of signatory nations. We want more Artemis partners. My colleague Mallory Stewart, the Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control Verification and Compliance, and her team also are working to advance the national security space policies of the U.S. government internationally. Next week, Assistant Secretary Stewart will travel to Geneva for the second meeting of the U.N. Open-Ended Working Group on Reducing Space Threats. The United States, working in close partnership with our allies and like-minded countries, sees this working group as an important opportunity for all nations to advance rules, norms, and principles of responsible behavior in outer space. Madam Vice President, as you have previously underscored, the establishment of the new international norms for outer space must start with a commitment by all spacefaring nations not to conduct destructive direct ascent anti-satellite missile testing. And as you noted, at the upcoming UN General Assembly, the, UN, U, the U.S. will sponsor a resolution calling on other nations to make the same commitment. And in the coming weeks, Assistant Secretary Stewart and her team will have extensive consultations at the UN. Our goal is that this resolution is adopted with the broadest possible support. Finally, the State Department's diplomatic efforts on space security norms are complemented by continued U.S. leadership at the U.N. Commi Committee for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPIUS. For nearly 60 years, this committee has played an indispensable role in upholding and strengthening the rules-based international order for outer space. Madam Vice President, at your recent meetings in Oakland, uh, it was demonstrated that the U.S. space industry can make a huge contribution mm -hmm. to sustainable exploration and use of outer space, and we will be working at the State Department to make sure that they are leading other nations by setting the right example. Thank you very much for your leadership. It's been an honor to be here today. Thank you. Great progress. Thank you very much. Um, OMB Deputy Director Nani Colaretti is here, and um, if you can talk a bit about the investments that our nation is making in space. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Vice President, for your leadership on this really critical work. Um, I'm here to talk about resources. Uh, earlier this year, the President put forward a budget that advances our civilian and commercial space efforts in several key ways, and I'm going to just briefly touch on a few of them. First, as you heard from the other panelists, uh, advancing climate and earth systems data is a high priority. That's why in the FY23 budget, we requested increased funding for earth science and observations to address the climate crisis, including by making detailed climate data freely available to scientists and policymakers. And I'm, I was really great to hear about everybody else's work on this here at this meeting. Second, the budget includes critical investments in the Artemis program 
that will bolster American leadership in human spaceflight, enabling astronauts to explore and work on the moon, as we heard earlier, uh, and lay the groundwork for the first crewed mission to Mars uh, in many, many years. And third, the budget request for NASA seeks to broaden and diversify student participation in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics to inspire uh, um, and develop the next generation of scientists, engineers, and explorers. And I'd also like to briefly note that our budget also requested an increase in funding for the Office of Space Commerce. We increased it by five times more than the current funding level. And it represents a 30% increase at the Defense Department, where we also increased the budget for vital space capabilities. So taken together, these investments are critical for delivering on the administration's priorities. Thanks. Thank you. And, and as we often say, um, the, the, the budget should reflect our priorities. And to see the increase in investment um, through the budget is very meaningful in terms of our commitment uh, to space exploration and our space program. So thank you for that. Okay. So I want to thank the council. Um, this was a good update in terms of the work we've done so far. And um, we obviously have a lot more to do, but there has been progress. And I, I, I do appreciate the way that the work has been accelerated um, to meet the demand, I think, for, for this kind of enthusiasm and attention and passion. Um, and it is making a difference. So thank you all very much. I'm going to now move us to the second session, which is on STEM and the workforce. And I welcome the panelists for our next session on STEM and workforce. And please come on up. Here is a nice table for you. It's almost like a Senate hearing. <laughs> <laughs> but you will not be cross-examined. <laughs> and we have Mr. Pablo Banda, who is biology and environmental science teacher at Milby High School here in Houston, Texas. <laughs> Dr. Harold Martin, the chancellor of North Carolina A&T University. <laughs> and Ms. Heather Bulk, who is the CEO of Special Aerospace Services. So welcome and thank you, each of you. So as I noted earlier, a highly trained and diverse workforce uh, is critical to the success of, of our work in space. And the jobs include not just engineers, not only, not only engineers and scientists, but also electricians and welders. And uh, as I was touring the facilities today, I met people who are working in mission control who, who started there right out of, out of college um, just because they were interested in space and they didn't really understand much beyond the fact that they had the passion, but there was an entry point for them. And so if you can talk about your work and, and how you can advise us to have a meaningful commitment to building the workforce, to creating excitement and enthusiasm around the STEM disciplines, and also to build a space workforce that I believe should inspire and should also prepare and then, of course, employ those who have these interests and these skills and this passion. So with that, I'm going to ask um, first that we will start with the Acting Director of the Office of Science and Technology and Policy, Dr. Alondra Nelson, to start us out in this discussion and talk about how our administration plans to do this work in collaboration with all the folks that are here. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Vice President, for your leadership. Thank you to our, our partners for being here. I look forward to our conversation um, about this important work. So this is an exciting time to be working in the realm of science and technology. The Chips and Science Act has launched historic investments in our STEM ecosystem, uh, investments that will transform science and technology in the United States now and long into the future. OSTP will leverage the Chips and Science Act to build uh, on your Space Council priorities and human space exploration, commercial space activities, uh, and of course, and STEM. All of these activities require that we include as many minds as possible in building the STEM workforce of the future. Since this council last convened, OSTP has led an interagency space STEM task force, so government to the table, which today is releasing its roadmap to support space-related STEM education and workforce. 
a report that lays out our vision for growing, diversifying, and strengthening the space workforce. This roadmap details immediate and long-term actions that agencies have committed to pursue, guided by diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. As you noted, Madam Vice President, these actions span three focus areas. They first inspire. We will use space as a lens to spark curiosity and cultivate interest in space-related re uh, STEM fields, targeting outreach to communities and regions that have historically been unengaged or underengaged. To do this, our agencies are, have created an online repository of free educator resources and career highlights to show the diversity of people working in STEM jobs throughout the government, like people that you met at Mission Control this mm -hmm. afternoon. Second, we will prepare. We will engage students in hands-on activities with experiential learning opportunities like paid internships, apprenticeships, and fellowships to ensure that more people have the skills, training, and access they need to effectively pursue space-related STEM jobs. And third, we will employ. As you know, there are real challenges that people encounter when they enter the workforce, the workforce including the space workforce. We will create new professional development programs and funding opportunities that will incentivize pathways to leadership across the federal space workforce. Under your leadership, Madam Vice President, this is the first time in this administration that the National Space Council and federal departments and agencies have come together to prioritize building and strengthening the space workforce. This whole of society strategy is a call to action for all of us here, partners as well, and government, educators, and everyone who works in STEM to build a STEM workforce for space that is open and accessible mm -hmm. to everyone. Mm -hmm. As we approach research, policy, and action in space, it is on all of us to ensure that we are employing the United States' most valuable asset, its people, to solve the great challenges of our time, climate crisis, national security, growing our economy, and uncovering the mysteries of space. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I thank you. I thank you for the work that you have been doing. Um, again, I, just accelerating this initiative in a way that is having real impact. Um, so now I will turn to our panelists, and I'm going to start with Mr. Banda, um, a high school science teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> of the professions, yeah. such a noble profession, to take on a life work that is about raising and nurturing the future of our country. So thank you very much. And, um, and please share with all of us, teach us, how can we use space, talk about space in a way that inspires the young leaders that you teach? Uh, good afternoon, Madam Vice, Vice President and distinguished members of the National Space Council. My name is Pablo Banda. I'm currently serving as the department chair at Milby High School, uh, where I currently teach AP Biology and AP Environmental Science. I teach at Title I school where the majority of the students are Hispanic and don't have the same access nor opportunities as other kids. As educators, we're facing uh, challenges on how best to engage our students, especially now, given that the learning gap has increased with the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. Without question, space is an exciting way to get my students engaged in STEM. Last year, our school partnered with NASA through a program funded by a grant from the Department of Education. Together, we were able to create some coursework for the students. We started with big questions like, when the astronauts go, go back to the moon, what do they need to survive? Hmm. Working with NASA education experts, the students engaged in a project called Growing Beyond Earth where they were able to create a radish station with the goal of creating the optimal conditions for plant growth. The students were able to test different soil compositions, the frequency of lighting, the amount of water, and other factors while collecting data throughout the entire process. They were so excited to think that one day their data could be utilized by NASA. In fact, four out of the five seniors that were working on this rigorous project, probably some, some of the brightest kids that I've ever met after doing this coursework, ended up changing their intended majors, going from construction science and architecture to majors such as aerospace engineering and astrophysics. And I'm happy to say that they just started their freshman year huh. uh, this past uh, uh In the end, one of the biggest draws to pursue STEM are the different jobs, especially in space. There's so many career uh, opportunities for the students today. 
Through a NASA teacher externship program, I was able to come to Johnson Space Center, and I was able to see mechanics and pilots at Ellington Field, divers at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, and even seamstresses making suits. All these individuals had something in common. They were able to tie their expertise to STEM. Yeah. But many of my students don't know what opportunities are out there and end up creating their goals only on what they're exposed to. My students need to see that there's a job in the space sector for everyone, no matter what the interest may be. And I strongly believe that an early career exposure is going to be key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the main challenges in teaching STEM is resources. As educators, we always welcome classroom materials, especially ones that involve space science. Mm -hmm. Another resource that STEM teachers can benefit from is professional development. I'm part of a NASA teacher externship where I met other educators, NASA experts, and seen amazing research firsthand. I can't wait to incorporate what I've learned and share it with my students. These teacher professional development programs really prepare us as STEM educators to engage students as well as build our own confidence to teach complex subjects. With more, more of these professional development opportunities, I'm sure other educators like myself will be equipped to inspire the next generation of scientists, engineers, and problem solvers. Thank you for your time, Madam Vice President. Thank you so very much. And uh, the collaboration that we have On the Space Council, it's been very intentional uh, that we are including educators uh, who are on the ground like you every day. The opportunities that are available should be, and, and we know they are, for people coming right out of high school, much less college or graduate degrees, uh, but having your input and, and your leadership is, is just absolutely invaluable. So thank you for that, and again, thank you for being a teacher. Um, I'll now turn to uh, Dr. Harold Martin and, um, and ask you, how is North Carolina A&T thinking about uh, working with federal agencies to prepare students to join the space workforce? Thank you very much, Madam Vice President, National Science Council members, fellow panelists, uh, and colleagues, it is doing an honor to be here to share my thoughts about the impact of minority serving institutions on preparing STEM graduates for the space industry. North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University has a long and distinguished and significant relationship with the space sector. Dr. Ron Lee McNair, an alumnus and one of NASA's first black astronauts, was killed in the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986. One of our engineering facilities, named in his honor, has been home to thousands of engineering graduates over the years and many more are currently enrolled and will enroll in years to come. And he continues to inspire these students today to exceed their expectations. The university has the distinction of graduating the largest number of black engineers per year over the past two decades. And we are aware of what it takes to prepare students for success in technical fields. ANT and other HBCUs such as Prairie View A&M University, uh, whose community we are in today and whose president, Dr. Ruth Simmons, is present with us today. Howard University. <laughs> Howard University, FAMU, Morgan State University, and others. And minority-serving institutions have a history of meeting students where they are and providing the education and skills development in classrooms, facilitating paid experiences in industry with our corporate partners, government partners, and research laboratories. HBCUs, and whose graduates have made significant contributions to human space flight and space exploration, and will continue to make significant scientific and technical contributions to space and private industry and through federal service. HBCUs are not alone. Community colleges, Hispanic serving institutions, and tribal colleges and universities all graduate leaders in space workforce. Mm -hmm. These institutions are being responsive and adapting their programs to meet industry's technical and workforce needs, but cannot do it alone. Relationships with industry and federal government are important and part of the success. For example, we're part of the Space Force University's partnership program that will enable us to expand our programs in science and technology and engineering programs and provide research opportunities for our students and faculty in our STEM disciplines. These programs are part, uh, but are not 
only significant of what we're doing today, they are a start. There are many more brilliant, talented, and innovative students, especially those from backgrounds underrepresented in STEM disciplines, from underrepresented communities who need mentoring and support through K-12 and who could use scholarship support, internships, pathways to graduate school, and full-time employment. Faculty are doing exceptional work in our research laboratories, but also looking for increased opportunities to drive innovation, explore expectations and opportunities, and share with our students in our classrooms, in our laboratories. So Madam President, we are, Vice President, we are very, very pleased to be a part of the solution, and we're thankful for the opportunities to be a part of the conversation with the National Space Council today. NASA, the National Science Foundation, the U.S. DOA, who continue to provide sustained support, and I look forward to continuing to deepen these significant relationships with both industry and the federal government. So thank you very much, Madam Vice President. Thank you, Chancellor. And part of the part of our administration's investment in minority-serving institutions, HBCUs, which has been in excess of five billion dollars, is with that very point about what we can do and need to do to, to give more resources to the venerable institutions that have historically produced um, our nation's scientists, engineers, and mathematicians. Um, and I want to recognize also uh, Deputy Secretary of Education Cindy Martin, who is here, who is. Um, is really a leader on a lot of these issues. So having heard from our two educators, uh, can you talk a bit about the work of the department under your leadership? Thank you so much, Madam Vice President. Thank and we you. love hearing from a teacher the way that you inspire by sparking interest, having students explore the career, and having professional development. You inspire our nation. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak on what the department's doing to inspire, prepare, and employ. Secretary Cardona and I are so deeply committed and focused on this to ensure that all of our students not just have access to, but that they feel that they belong in high quality STEM education, both in and out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. A feeling of belonging matters for our students because we know that sense of belonging is how we inspire, which is your first charge of this commission. The next generation of innovators, and that's how they enter into space exploration. Students can dream big when they're in classrooms, like we just heard Mr. Mm -hmm. Banda speak about. So to that end, the Department of Education is pursuing multiple strategies across multiple fronts to enhance STEM education workforce and to support the delivery of inclusive STEM learning across all classrooms and experiences that will engender a sense of belonging to STEM students across the country. We also know from our extensive stakeholder engagement that we're involved in that expanding access to the high quality sustainable programs of an ecosystem of partners includes industry sector, community organizations that are so passionate about this, and state and local governments, as well as the voices of our youth. All students across the country and teachers have passion around this topic, as well as our parents, listening That's to right. all of the stakeholders who help us see the path forward. We in the federal government and this administration have an opportunity in this moment to strengthen those connections within that ecosystem that already exists. So for example, education is collaborating with the space industry leaders in developing space career challenge for high school students and we're partnering with NASA to engage after school youth mm -hmm. in space related engineering design challenges that are awesome to see the kids participate in. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the Department of Education is elevating STEM education as a departmental priority, and we're bolstering our role as a leader in the STEM ecosystem, which we'll know, we know is going to lay the foundation that will help us grow the future space workforce, mm -hmm. one that's diverse, mm -hmm. one that's highly trained, and one that's ready to provide solutions for our future, for the challenges not just of today and of tomorrow. There's a place for everyone in space. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Thank you so very much. And I also want to acknowledge Dr. Ruth Simmons, who's here, um, the president of Prairie View a and um, I also know that we have uh, Reginald DeRoche, who's here, and um, from Rice University. And I want to thank him as well. So
So with that, I will now uh, turn to our uh, Under Secretary of Defense, Heidi um, Shiyu, and I'd ask you to please provide uh, your perspective on this discussion and how you are thinking through the Department of Defense about how we can invest in STEM and, and our future workforce. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Uh, the Department of Defense has a great responsibility to ensure that our nation remains safe. Space is one of the 14 technology areas that we have identified as being critical to our national defense. To ensure that we stay ahead, the DOD is committed to developing the technologies and the talent that's needed to address the challenges of our mission in the space domain. Universities are an essential partner to this department. We must work together to develop the workforce and the technologies of the future. This is why we are expanding our efforts to ensure all Space Force ROTC scholarship cover 100% of college tuitions and fees. Another important milestone today, the Space Force today signed its 14th University Partnership Program with the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagos. This highly rated College of Engineering produces some of the best engineers in this country. As a Hispanic serving institution, UPRM will help the Space Force grow and maintain a diverse and inclusive workforce. Congratulations to Chancellor Dr. Ruyan and our own Chief of Space Operations, General Raymond. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. These are just two examples of how the department is actively looking across the services and components for innovative ways to grow our talent pool, especially in coordination with minority-serving institutions, tribal colleges and universities, and HBCUs. A well-coordinated effort across the federal agencies, academia, and industry will result in a more strategic approach to partnering and ensure that we will have a better developed, diverse space workforce. The department is looking forward to contributing to this important effort. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And uh, now I'd like to turn to Ms. Bulk, uh, the CEO of Spe uh, Special Aerospace Services. And if you could share a bit about how you're thinking that the space industry can recruit and develop the workforce in space. How are you thinking about that? Madam Vice President and distinguished members of the Council, it's truly an honor and a privilege to speak with you today. I'm the CEO of Special Aerospace Services, a woman-owned company that provides engineering and hardware to civil, NASA defense and space programs. I'm also an executive committee member of the Aerospace Industries Association. And in both of these roles, one of my top priorities is developing and expanding the workforce. Today, most of us know that there is an insatiable and ever-increasing demand for both space services and space hardware. Therefore, our industry has what I refer to as an urgent and ongoing need for talent. Thank you. As I was saying, today there is an insatiable and ever-increasing demand for space services and hardware. Therefore, our industry has an urgent and ongoing need for talent. I'd like to suggest three ways in which we need to think differently about how we attract, recruit, and, as we've been discussing today, employ that talent. First, when it comes to recruiting engineers, scientists, and technicians, our industry needs to realize that there is also a true wealth of talent in academic communities that we have traditionally overlooked. Mm -hmm. such as HBCUs, minority-serving institutions, colleges, and tech schools. When we partner with these institutions, we not only find amazing and highly competent talent, we also get this incredible added bonus of diversity. Let me tell you what Xavier, 
Zay is a manufacturing engineer at SAS. She brings talent, she brings diversity, and a true zest for our industry. And we found her because rather than going to the same places that we've been going to year after year, we thought about things a little bit different and we went to some HBCUs. Zay has proven to be an invaluable team member, not only at our company, but a true asset to our clients as well for their incredibly important missions. Second, I'd like to talk about one of my favorite topics, skilled technical workforce. And mm -hmm. the skilled technical workforce is, is something that when we talk about our machinists, our electricians, our welders, and, ex and inspectors, our industry has got to think different here. By hiring for the skills needed to do the job, rather than the educational requirements that right. we traditionally looked at. Like you, Madam Vice President, not everyone, as you said, not everyone needs a college degree. Mm -hmm. And they cannot necessarily have a college degree to have incredible impact in our industry. Students can come straight out of high school into apprenticeship programs, community colleges and trade schools, Students, as well as those looking to pivot into our industry, like our critical veterans in our United States. These individuals can immediately come out onto a solid path of having a good job, good salary, and working with state-of-the-art technologies while contributing to an incredibly exciting and important mission. One of our machinists by the name of Caleb was with the U.S. Navy, and he worked on power plants aboard the USS George Bush. MSU Denver, a university that we partner with, sent us his resume and said, you should really take a look. We hired him, and he's taken those military skills and been able to effectively pivot into our very valuable space industry. He's an example of a veteran who might have previously been overlooked and is now making an incredible contribution to our industry. Finally, if the space industry is gonna to continue to enable national security, creating economic opportunity and drive innovation, we need to have truly united efforts on the part of the government, industry, and academia to effectively address this pressing talent issue. An incredibly good example of this is our new facility in Huntsville, Alabama. I see business, academia, and government effectively coming together to address industry workforce needs, not only for today, but for the future. We need to be doing more of this type of collaboration and modeling what's taking place there. Together, we can truly make a real and sustainable mm -hmm. impact for the advancements of our space workforce. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you for giving voice to that. And um, to close out this panel and, and, and offer your thoughts, I'm going to ask the Chief Innovation Officer for the Department of Labor, Chiki Agu, to please give your perspective on, on how we are thinking about this as a workforce issue through the lens of the Department of Labor and your mission to, to grow America's labor and workforce in a way that we are competitive and strong. Uh, thank you, Madam Vice President. And as you know from Secretary Walsh, our mission is to make sure that every American is prepared for and employed in a good job. And what you heard from Mrs. Bulk is the opportunity for the space sector to do that. Yeah. And so since our last uh, Space Council meeting, we have done deep research into the jobs that are most in demand in the space sector. Number one, using our existing data, but also in deep conversation with employers and trade associations. And then going a step further, we actually gathered this summer at the department over 40 employers, higher education institutions, community-based organizations to dig into those jobs and find the skills that are, that, that are most in need for each of those. And what we found during those conversations was what you've heard, an emer urgent and emergent need for skilled technical workforce in the space sector. And when we say that, we mean welders, fabricators, uh, testing uh, specialists, non-quality uh, um, control specialists. Uh, and what we heard from every stakeholder, bluntly, was that American competitiveness in space depends on filling this need. And so uh, at the Department of Labor, what we see is that this uh, need creates an opportunity to bring in workers from uh, communities that have traditionally been overlooked, 
and underserved for a long time. And, and we, we think of everyone from returning citizens to folks in rural communities to uh, uh, folks who are, for, uh, who are opportunity youth. Again, we can use this problem in some ways to solve another. Yeah. And then really what we know this requires is new industry partnerships. Uh, where industry is working hand in hand with academia, training providers, to make sure that we have the workforce that we need. That's why we're so excited about the industry commitment today that you, that, that you announced. We need more things like that to basically solve this problem. And for us, the Department of Labor, we commit to two actions by the end of 2023. Number one, we are going to update and augment the Department of Labor aerospace competency model to include space activities so that whether you're an employer or an, or an, or an, or an academic provider, you know the skills that are required so that you can help facilitate skills-based training, skills-based hiring, and creating that diverse workforce that we all need. Number two, by the end of 2023, we commit to conducting the first registered apprenticeship accelerator focused on the space sector. This, this accelerator will bring together employers, academic providers, uh, training providers to come together and further the use of registered apprenticeship to fill these critical roles and also create that workforce that, that, not, that not only uh, fulfills the need but also looks like the country. I think if we do all these things, we're going to uh, create a space that makes us competitive, competitive up in space but that also creates careers here on Earth. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And um, the theme that we've heard on this point to your point, is uh, thinking about how we define the job, not based on a title or the name of a degree, but what skills are required to actually to perform the job. Correct. And, and also what we've heard is the critical relationship then between government, between academia, educators, and the industry to build America's workforce and space. So thank you all very much. Thank you for participating and for your leadership. And we are going to move now to our third session. So as um, they leave, I will, um, I'll say that, that the commitments that you've all heard today are part of a set of commitments from government agencies and from the private sector that was released in the White House fact sheet that was released this morning. So I invite everyone to take a look at that. And after today's discussion on the subject of STEM, there are, in essence, three um, or two, well, three actually new initiatives that I'd like to see. And so I'm going to offer you those as part of the the, the prompt for the next phase of this work. Uh, one, I'm asking the Department of Education to create a plan uh, within 90 days to stand up a new STEM office at the department and to lead STEM education activities as we've discussed in partnerships across the public and private sectors and to expand pathways to space careers. And it sounds like you're well on your way to do that, but that is um, the request that I'd like to make coming out of today's convening. Um, second, I'm asking OSTP within 120 days to inventory and align all of the space-related investments and partnerships between the federal government and colleges and universities so that we can have some guidelines and some uh, timelines on moving that work forward, and it sounds like it's well underway. Finally, if we're to maintain space leadership as a country and strengthen our industrial base and create good quality jobs, um, I do believe that uh, we are well on the way to do that. It's a federal program that uh, is really focused on a lot of the kind of work that we are talking about today. So that will be part of the due out of our, of our work on STEM. And with that, I will introduce our, our third and, and final panel on human space exploration. And I welcome Dr. Aruna Sharma, who is a research scientist at Cedar sinai and Ms. Karina Dries, who is the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation. Welcome to you both. Uh, human exploration is a natural topic here at the Johnson Space Center, which of course is the home of the astronaut corps and mission control. So as we transition, as I spoke earlier, uh, as we transition from the International Space Station to what we are doing around commercial space stations, our administration is, as I've said, committed to ensuring a smooth bridge between space activities of today and those of tomorrow. Uh, and it is why, as I said earlier, we are committed to extend 
our investment in the International Space Station through 2030 to ensure a smooth transition as we move forward. And of course, we look forward to our partners making similar commitments. So as we are looking forward, then I'd ask our panelists, and I'll start with you, Dr. Sharma, what is your perspective on the value of the work that is happening there, and in particular, the research that is happening in microgravity? Will you explain to us all why the research that happens there is different than what happens here, and how it might advance all of our interests? Certainly. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I'd like to speak today about the potential and the possibilities for conducting scientific research aboard the ISS, the International Space Station, and in low Earth orbit. The U.S. National Laboratory on the International Space Station has been critically important in enabling scientists like myself to utilize microgravity for research leading to Earth-side benefits. In 2016, astronaut Dr. Kate Rubens, a microbiologist, conducted a number of pioneering biomedical research experiments aboard the ISS, including the first DNA sequencing in space. In another experiment, she grew a sample of beating human heart cells to help us understand how the single cells of the human body function in space. It sounds like science fiction, but it certainly wasn't. I co-led this Heart Cells in Space project when I was a graduate student at Stanford University, and it has been the foundation for my independent research laboratory at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. The human heart cells that astronaut Rubens grew on orbit changed their genetics and how they beat in microgravity. But interestingly, most of these changes reverted back to normal when the cells returned back to the planet. From the results of this project, we learned just how adaptable the individual cells of the human body are to microgravity. This is just one example of the cutting edge research that is being conducted every day aboard the International Space Station. Physical science experiments in microgravity are helping us improve fire resistant fabrics worn by military personnel, electrical workers, and firefighters. Material science research on the International Space Station is leading to the development of advanced fiber optic cables far better than what can be made on Earth. But as a biomedical scientist, I am most excited about how we can harness microgravity to grow cells and biological materials in ways that are simply impossible on Earth. For example, our laboratory in the Cedar sinai Regenerative Medicine Institute is launching a project focused on stem cell biology to the International Space Station next year. This project will examine how pluripotent stem cells, which are powerful cells that can turn into nearly any cell type found in the human body, might grow better or faster in microgravity. Results from these studies could lead to new therapies for diseases such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, which are all being researched in low Earth orbit. Thanks to the International Space Station and the U.S. National Laboratory, microgravity is more accessible than ever for scientific research benefiting life on Earth. I am so excited for the amazing discoveries that we will make in space in the years to come. Thank you. I am too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, can you speak a little bit about your perspective on this? I know you've given it so much thought. I'll give you a couple of other examples on the stem cells, for example. What is it about microgravity or zero-g that helps you, to say, for example, cancer research? All right, we use stem cells now uh, in part of our research on looking for cures. But you have to have millions of stem cells. And the problem is when on Earth, in one gravity, you grow stem cells, they all fall to the bottom, and most of them die. Now, take that stem cell growth to zero G on the space station. Hmm. And now they don't fall to the bottom. You can harvest so many more. And then as you bring them back to Earth, keeping them alive, you've got, Madam Vice President, all the additional stem cells. Let me give you one other example. Uh, in cancer research, Keytruda, this drug that has been so effective 
for example, President Carter had 90 days to live, and he started taking Keytruda. Well, the problem is that it's very hard to make Keytruda on one gravity. What they have learned is making it in zero G, they find out new ways of making it that they can make more and faster. And those are just two examples. And by the way, out of all this research that's going on, we're looking at $70 billion in 50 states uh, employing, closing in on 400,000 people. So it has a big economic impact as well. Thank you, Administrator Nelson. And, and as you know, my mother was a scientist, so I, I just am very excited about all of this. She was a breast cancer researcher, but the, the, just the unknown potential of this new level of research and what it will do to improve the human condition and save lives. It's very exciting. Thank you for that. Uh, Ms. Dries, can you talk with, with us a bit about how public-private partnerships drive innovation in space? Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Vice President and distinguished members of the Space Council for the opportunity to present today. The commercial space industry, in close partnership with NASA and the Department of Defense, is helping to usher in a new era of exploration, economic expansion, and national security resilience that will ensure continued American leadership on Earth and in space. Commercial space is an innovation engine in this country, generating billions of dollars of annual economic activity and employing hundreds of thousands of workers. This success has been enabled by the U.S. government leveraging public-private partnerships and firm fixed-price contracts that incentivize innovation, affordability, and performance. Through a commercial model, NASA has restored domestic access to the ISS for 20 to $30 billion less than a traditional approach would have cost, which has opened up the gateway to LEO and a new era for researchers and innovators. The same launch vehicles developed to send crew and cargo to the ISS have allowed America to dominate the global commercial space launch market, a field that had moved almost entirely overseas prior to the introduction of NASA's COTS initiative. Building upon the success of this model, NASA awarded commercial LEO destinations contracts to ensure an American presence after ISS retirement. These platforms, along with commercial suborbital services, will build on the legacy of the ISS to support microgravity research and development. The discoveries that will be made in microgravity will impact fields as diverse as medicine, communications, and industrial manufacturing. America must encourage private sector development to counter growing Chinese influence and capabilities in the space arena. We don't have time to waste in LEO as other nations rapidly mature their capabilities. It is critical to avoid a gap between ISS decommissioning and the operations of these commercial LEO destinations. NASA's leadership and willingness to work with commercial providers ensures we can leverage the ISS by continued use of, of private astronaut missions to increase commercial access. The U.S. government could also refine operational procedures for commercial users and drive down costs on commercial crewed spacecraft to generate additional demand with CLDs. We also recommend implementing regulatory reforms that enhance innovation and creating a transparent environment which is conducive to private sector investment. We applaud OSTP's strategic vision and industry outreach, and we are dedicated to working closely with NASA, the Department of Commerce, and the Department of Transportation to help implement this vision timely and safely. Thank you again for the opportunity to address the Space Council today. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And I'll now turn to the Deputy Secretary of Transportation, um, Polly Trottenberg. And if you could, she spoke of the, the collaboration with, with the Department of Transportation. If you could talk a bit about that. Yeah, thank you so much, Madam Vice President. Glad to be here on behalf of the Department of Transportation and the Federal Aviation Administration. And we certainly agree that the private sector plays a critical role in American leadership in space. We've been working collaboratively with the uh, industry to create a streamlined launch and reentrancing licensing requirement rule. We've also been working with the industry before the official licensing process begins to help understand the industry needs and innovative concepts and help guide them through the process. We're going to continue to do so while ensuring that our regulatory environment 
continues to foster industry growth, but of course focuses on safety for the American people. So far in commercial space, we've established a great safety record, 550 operations licensed with none resulting in a public death or injury, but we know we need to keep focusing on that safety record. And I'm pleased to say we are strengthening interagency partnerships today. I'm proud to announce that the FAA and the NTSB have signed a memorandum of agreement to clarify each organization's responsibilities investigating commercial launch and reentry re safety events. I'd like to take a moment to thank the NTSB Chair, Jennifer Hammondy, the Acting FAA Administrator, Billy Nolan, and Kevin Coleman, who's FAA's leader in commercial space, for all their leadership in putting this agreement together. I finally want to say that we're looking ahead and preparing for the future. We're revising and updating a set of recommended practices for human spaceflight occupant safety. We're actively engaged with industry stakeholders in the development of consensus standards that will establish safety norms across the human safe flight industry. And we're in the process of standing up an aerospace rulemaking committee that will engage stakeholders on commercial human spaceflight. I want to thank you, Madam Vice President, for your leadership, and we look forward to that continued collaboration. Thank you. Great progress. Uh, so essentially, a lot of this discussion in this panel has been about synchronizing the work across government and the commercial sector to ensure our increased leadership. And um, as we have heard, there have been many um, inflection points in terms of the progress that the Council has made between the last meeting and today. In furtherance of that approach, I'm going to ask three things. Uh, two of NASA and one of the Department of Transportation. One, uh, that Na NASA will develop a plan for a new microgravity national lab as we transition from the ISS to the uh, commercial space stations. Uh, two, that NASA will finalize a plan for an initial lunar surface architecture within the next 150 days to include a consideration for commercial and international partnerships. And then for the Department of Transportation to identify interim steps uh, within the next year to use the authorities that currently exist to ensure the safety of humans in space flight. And that obviously is a priority for all of us. And with that, I thank you all and I thank our panelists and we'll move on to the next session. Thank you very much. And now I will welcome the next panelists. And um, this is our final session on rules for commercial novel space activities. And with us we have Dr. Ruth Stitwell, who is the Executive Director of Aerospace Policy Solutions. Welcome. We have Dr. Chris Kunstadter, please, who is the Senior Vice President at XL Catlin. And we have uh, Mr. Babek Navravesh. Excuse me. Please forgive me. I'm going to I'm going to do that again. It's important to pronounce correctly. It's Nikravesh, and he is a partner at Morrison and Forrester. Welcome to the three of you. And um, as we have talked earlier, uh, and it was mentioned actually, I was at the Chabot Space Center in Oakland recently and heard from our private sector folks about how they are, how the technology is moving so quickly and their innovation is moving forward so rapidly to the point that the companies who are developing these capabilities don't fall squarely into, any, into existing regulations. The regulations that were written were written long before most of this innovation and technology had actually developed. And so this panel is designed to offer us additional perspectives about the need for clear and predictable, which is very important, predictable and flexible regulatory frameworks. And so with that, I'm going to start with Dr. Stitwell, Stilwell and ask, um, what is the context in which this discussion is occurring and how are you thinking about current novel space activities and, um, and, and the situation we're in in terms of the regulatory challenges. Thank you, Madam Vice President. It is an honor to speak with you today. 
commercial space itself, as you said, is not new. We've had commercial satellites since the 1960s, commercial space launches since the 1980s, and the regulatory frameworks evolved gradually with the industry. But the last decade has seen radical change in both volume and diversity. In 2011, the U.S. licensed one commercial space launch. In 2021, it was 64. Six with space tourists on board for the first time. If the difference were just our increased volume, then the path forward would be straightforward. But the diversity in operations and in the addition of novel space activities creates a regulatory challenge, but it is also a regulatory opportunity to clarify and streamline existing government structures to ensure we have the agility that enables innovation. Novel space activities are emerging in suborbital, on orbit, and in deep space like on-orbit servicing, in-space manufacturing, asteroid mining, and soon active debris removal, and even rocket cargo. The last few years have seen a lot of work to define and refine the whole of government approach and establishing and funding a lead agency. That is important progress. Because the traditional well-worn areas of space activity, we have very clear lines of regulatory authority. For launch and re-entry, the transportation phase, it falls within the Department of Transportation. That's clear. The allocation of spectrum and avoiding signal interference, very clearly FCC. But when we get into other commercial areas that require not just authorization but continuing supervision in space, we need a clear, predictable, flexible regulatory approach to support an industry with applications we may not yet have envisioned and to ensure that they have a state safe environment in which to operate. Our forward-looking approach should clarify the regulatory structure to be fully transparent so that the industry has neither the obligation nor the opportunity to go forum shopping for authorization. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, to make sure that none of our obligations go unmet. I thank the council for their attention to this very important issue. Thank you. Dr. Kunstadter, can you talk a bit about the uh, the insurance industry and how you are thinking about responsible behavior in space and, and how the industry can incentivize responsible activity in space? Thank you, Madam Vice President, and thank you to the National Space Council for inviting me to speak with you today. Space is a fundamental part of the global economy. And space insurance for launch in and in-orbit operations is a critical enabler of innovation and investment. We provide the financial certainty that allows companies to develop novel technologies and applications and encourages investors, including the U.S. government, to support these activities. The rapid growth in the number of satellites and other objects in orbit heightens the very real risk of collision. This is really an environmental issue, the space environment. Hmm. Accurate tracking and timely collision avoidance are crucial to ensuring that our capabilities in space remain intact. I'm here to suggest solutions and to urge the space community, including the United States government, to act today to minimize problems tomorrow. In my work, I partner with satellite and launch operators and manufacturers, government agencies, and many others to promote safety and incentivize responsible space activity. We actively support companies developing innovative solutions for space traffic management, such as miniature beacons and ground-based radars for tracking objects, and small low-power propulsion for collision avoidance and post-mission disposal. And we encourage our clients to implement these and other solutions. Just as we in the insurance community can incentivize our clients and others to be safe and responsible, so too the U.S. government, through regulation and being a role model, can lead the way at home and abroad in incentivizing adoption of measures to keep space safe for all. You know, when I was a kid, seatbelts were an extra cost option in cars. You had to pay extra for safety. The U.S. government saw the significant role that seatbelts played in saving lives and mandated them in all cars. Today, you won't find a car on the road without seatbelts. In the same way, the U.S. government can recognize the role that, that beacons, radars, propulsion, and other technologies play in space safety. Through encouraging development and incentivizing adoption of technologies and practices that promote safety and responsibility, the U.S. government, along with the space insurance providers, can help the space industry to make them ubiquitous and second nature, just like seatbelts. 
A significant collision in space will have a chilling effect, not only on space insurance, but on all space activity, and we can't afford that. We support America's continuing leadership in space, and we look forward to adoption of novel solutions to make safe, uh, space safer and more sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nikravesh, how can, as has been discussed, clear and predictable and flexible regulations be conducive with a constructive investment environment? How are you thinking about that? I, 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 I think we all believe we should reject false choices. We can do both. So can you talk a little bit about that? I'd be happy to. Thank you, Madam Vice President, and thank you to the National Space Council for the opportunity to speak today. This is a very exciting time for the commercial space industry. 2021 witnessed more than $15 billion invested in space-related businesses, nearly doubling the amount from the year before. Venture capital accounted for the great majority of those dollars, as it has for the past few years. We saw more venture capital targeting space startups than ever before, both in terms of absolute dollars and number of transactions. And that should come as no surprise. Venture investors are comfortable making bets on early stage high growth businesses, which present greater degrees of risk than businesses favored by other industries. But the check sizes of venture investors tend to be smaller, and maturing space technology startups looking to accelerate growth need access to more significant sources of capital. Institutional investors, including long-term minded investors like public sector pension plans and sovereign wealth funds, offer the promise of larger check sizes and more patient capital, just what growing space businesses need. Yet these investors are historically risk averse. They may be stewards of their national wealth or fiduciaries responsible for investing monies to, to provide retirement benefits to beneficiaries. They are by necessity careful. And while a limited allocation to riskier propositions in any well-balanced portfolio is appropriate, their approach to investing often tends to be more conservative. The promotion and development of a comprehensive legal and regulatory regime to govern the emerging private sector capabilities in space would do much to reassure institutional investors and promote private investment in commercial space. Mm -hmm. Efforts to clarify the rights and obligations of companies and counterparties, improve legal certainty in key areas, and otherwise to reduce the risks the inherent risks, and thereby improve the value proposition of space-related investments should be encouraged. Mm -hmm. To be sure, this effort requires us to improve and harmonize our domestic laws and regulatory regimes. But this effort must be a multilateral one as well. Space is the province of all humankind, and all nations and peoples, public and private actors alike, stand to benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nikravesh. Thank you. Well, thank you to the panelists. I'd like to now turn to members of the Council for your perspective on novel space activities. And I'm going to start, I'm going to come back to you, Bill, and talk a bit. Can you talk a bit about um, how you're thinking about this subject in particular, novel space activities and where we are and where we need to be as a government? We are going to see an explosion of increasing economic activity in space. Now, it's interesting that we take so much of it for granted and look how much of it has already expanded. We take for granted the fact that we get live uh, interviews from London about Queen Elizabeth. Uh, my daughter can't drive from point A to point B without putting it in her GPS. Uh, and the universe is the future. It, there's no limit as to what we're going to see. So they're going to be not only the commercial activities, which have been uh, listed here, and many, many more that are going to occur, such as mining of asteroids, mining on the moon, what kind of regulatory effort is going to be there? Uh, if we ever perfect fusion, there's going to be a lot of harvesting of helium-3 
that's on the surface of the moon. And by the way, it's not only going to be a domestic marketplace, it's going to be an international marketplace. I appreciate so much what you've been doing trying to get other nations to sign the Artemis Accords, which in effect uh, sets a, a, a community of standards that says we go in peace, but we're going to do this helping out our neighbors. We're going to have commonality of uh, space infrastructure so that we could help each other if we get into trouble. Uh, but the future, uh, there are things that are going to occur that we don't even know what the questions are to ask now. So it's going to be an exciting future, but it's going to be a very, very uh, important one of trying to figure out how we regulate all of this in an international context. Thank you. And again, being intentional to ensure we don't in any way suppress innovation um, with all of the other parameters being intact, uh, including flexibility. Yeah. I'm going to turn now to the Principal Deputy Director of the National Intelligence, Stacey Dixon, and if you can talk a bit about um, how you are thinking about the issue of novel space activity. Thank you, Madam Vice President. America has done a great job enabling private innovation in space. Our biggest challenge now is how to harvest it. To support national security, we must foster even more U.S. space startups to thrive, engage early with the intelligence community, and help solve our most challenging problems. Today, we already enjoy GPS, satellite communications, weather satellites, and images of our Earth for many different applications. Our commercial industry will improve upon all these services by transforming how we build rockets, manufacture and launch satellites, refuel them on orbit, create habitats in space, manage space traffic, and find resources on the moon. Our national security depends upon these capabilities, not just for defending ourselves in space, or better understanding the activities of our adversaries, but also for providing critical services that support our entire economy and our way of life. We must build out the new space infrastructure to sustain the next generation of ideas. If not, we will have to rely on someone else to do it for us. U.S. space companies need more predictability from our government to raise the kind of venture capital and take the kinds of business risks that will drive our space economy to new heights, they need clear rules upon which they can deliver those amazing capabilities. A clear regulatory environment will remove ambiguity and unlock new frontiers for our bold commercial industry to generate sustainable businesses and improve our national security in space. As both public and private entities operate off-planet, we need an established set of rules, a shared and reliable infrastructure, and an international code of conduct. As companies innovate new capabilities for us, they will also need our security expertise and our partnership to operate safely and free from future threats in space. Madam Secretary, or Madam Vice President, the intelligence community is committed to working on these fundamental building blocks with the rest of the U.S. government. Thank you Thank so you. very much. Uh, and, and as a natural segue to your points, I'm going to ask uh, General Dickinson, who is U.S. Space Command uh, Commander, to talk a bit about the implications to national security of novel space activities. General. Thank you, Madam Vice President, and it's an honor to be here today. The innovation coming out of industry today is bringing an enormous amount of capability, capacity, and opportunity to the table that we historically did not have in national security space. Commercial innovation is now outpacing the demand signal from the government. This presents opportunities for the DOD to develop new and deeper relationships with industry. Commercial sector innovations can help the joint force maintain a technological advantage over China, Russia, and others. Harnessing the growing space economy will also enable a more holistic approach to the department's execution of integrated deterrence. And that is exactly what we're doing today. For example, the Department of Defense spent more than $135 million over the past four years on commercial space domain awareness data. Commercial space capabilities and services that enhance our ability 
to identify, characterize, and respond to activities in space provide enhanced flexibility to meet today's challenges in an ever-increasing contested domain. So as we look to develop a clear regulatory environment, it is important that we encourage American ingenuity to stay at the forefront of space technology. The strength of our commercial partners directly contributes to our national security as well as our prosperity. A space domain where standards and norms of behavior are identified and respected is vital to our national security mission, just like it does in any other domain. So the Department of Defense continues to execute our mission in a responsible manner to promote a safe, secure, stable, sustainable, and accessible space domain. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. And I also want to recognize General Raymond, who is here, who is the Chief of Space Operations for the U.S. Space Force. Thank you, General. And um, next, uh, Deputy Secretary John Tan of Homeland Security, would you talk a bit about how DHS is partnering with the space industry in this regard? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice President. Uh, and thank you, Madam Vice President, for convening the National Space Council and for convening this great community of industry leaders, of experts, and of academic leaders. I think today we've all heard how much this community talks about ideas and about information flow and data flow. So to that end, uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security, Secretary Ali Mayorkas, uh, recently signed uh, out DHS's uh, space policy. And the focus was on ideas and was on information flow in two manners. First, in terms of uh, ideas, it's really about intellectual property. And in terms of uh, information flow, it's much about cybersecurity especially uh, on the ground, but also on orbit. There are two ways that we're going to do this through the Department of Homeland Security. First, uh, for the Department of Homeland Security's Homeland Security Investigations Intellectual Property Rights Coordination Center, which protect against intellectual property theft, uh, against illicit trade practices, and to help ensure uh, fairness in the global marketplace. And in terms of cybersecurity, uh, DHS to include through DHS's cybersecurity infrastructure and security agency will continue to help defend cyberspace. Also, Madam Vice President, and to this community, we want to continue to engage with this community, community uh, industry leaders, academia, and we are going to do so through our continued leadership of the uh, Space Systems Critical Infrastructure Working Group and through uh, combination with uh, this entire interagency, with your Space Council, in particular with the Department of Commerce, uh, to continue to lead our joint symposias, which we've actually had three over the last year. And the last one in June 2022 had over 1,200 uh, participants from uh, industry and from academia. We look forward to continuing to defend cyberspace and the idea so all of these leading minds can continue to push the boundaries of exploration. Thank you. Thank you so very much, and please thank the Secretary as well. Uh, I'm going to now ask three of our council members in tandem, or you can just work it out to, figure, to talk a bit about um, how your agencies have um, existing mandates for space regulations and what you have found to be the best practices. And so I'm going to ask Deputy Secretary Don Graves, Deputy Secretary Polly Trottenberg, and the Chairwoman of the FCC, Jessica Rosenworcel, to um, share with us a bit about how you're thinking about it. And Chairwoman, why don't we just start with you? Sure. Well, thank you, Madam Vice President, for your leadership and for having me here today. This is the first time the FCC is joining the National Space Council. I think that's a good thing because we're doing a lot to help grow commercial space policy in the 21st century. And to respond to your question, I want to point to something we did just starting yesterday. We have kicked off an effort to help clean up outer space and our skies and address orbital debris. To understand why that's important, you've really got to look back and recognize that for billions of years, space was not a landscape for human endeavors. But then the space race began, and in 1958, NASA launched Vanguard into the skies, and it still circles the planet today. Now, when Vanguard was launched, it was this monument to American commitment to the future of space. But today, it also represents something else. It's a reminder that it's still up there, 
and we have work to do to address orbital debris. In fact, since Vanguard was launched, we've had more than 10,000 satellites launched into our skies. More than half of them are now defunct. Mm -hmm. They're not being used. And many of them were just launched with the understanding that it was cheaper to leave them up there than to ever make an effort to deorbit. So we've got to address this space junk. It's bad because it increases the risk of collision, which decreases the functionality of space, and it also makes it difficult to launch new satellites at higher orbit. And for a long time, policy in the United States has been, you don't really have to take this stuff down until 25 years after your mission's complete. 25 years is an awfully long time. Our space economy is moving fast, so at the FCC, we're going to make this effort move faster, and I've just proposed that we change that 25-year period to five years. We are also increasing the speed at which we are addressing satellite licensing by bulking up our ranks of engineers and policy experts, and we're also, for the first time, making available spectrum for commercial space launches. And these are the kind of things we're doing to help grow the space economy and also protect space and make sure it's sustainable. Thank you. Trottenberg or Graves? There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Trottenberg. Vice President. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, as one of the major regulatory agencies, we certainly recognize novel space activities do require regulatory clarity and flexibility and predictability. Obviously, from DOT and FAA's point of view, our focus is on ensuring the safety of people and property and being mindful of the economic, national security, and foreign policy interests of the United States. I'm proud to say we've taken some real steps to improve our regulatory process, and we're going to continue the improvement, but we created, as I said, the Streamline Launch and Reentry Licensing Requirements Rule. We published it in March of last year, and for us it's really been a game changer. It did a few things. First, it combined four disparate regulatory parts into one, so hopefully made the process easier. It replaced a lot of prescriptive requirements with clear safety criteria and performance-based requirements that we believe will allow industry flexibility and innovation. And it allowed for a single license to cover multiple launches from multiple sites, something we heard was important to the industry. In association with the rule, the FAA has also published a number of advisory circulars to help provide clarity to the industry about how they might go about demonstrating compliance with new performance-based requirements. And we continue, we hope to continue to work with the industry. We know there's going to be ongoing work to make sure that we have a regulatory regime which ensures safety but provides clarity and, and, and uh, clarity and certainty for the industry. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Deputy Secretary Graves, thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, I, building off of the really fantastic points made by our panelists, uh, we believe that it's absolutely critical for the U.S. to ensure that all commercial space missions are properly authorized and supervised. And Commerce's role as a regulator of remote sensing satellites and high-tech U.S. exports, as well as our work in developing the architecture for space traffic management and protecting intellectual property, allows us to to have, I think, particularly unique insights into the innovative space operations and the regulations that govern and sometimes don't govern these operations. So first, in industries with rapid technological change, it's important to build a collaborative process that incorporates continuous input from the companies that are being regulated. Second, we need a clear and predictable regulatory environment that allows companies to experiment and innovate within the bounds of as Polly said, clearly understood rules. Mm -hmm. Finally, we need a regulatory structure that can change in response to the rapid introduction of new technologies. Recognizing the complexity of the existing space regulatory framework, I believe that the U.S. should consider establishing a space portal to direct new space entrepreneurs to the applicable space authorization processes and the right agencies. A space portal could offer an easy on entry point those looking for guidance and assistance with regulations across multiple agencies. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for the work and the thought that you've all put into this issue. There's still more work to be done, but the theme of this panel uh, and, and this discussion has been collaboration. And um, so thank you, panelists, for your work and for your contribution to this discussion and how we think about this issue. And, um, and council members, thank all of you. So I will close us out with a couple of 
thoughts. Uh, one, today we have heard from members of industry, we have heard from educators, we have heard from government agencies, we have heard from regulatory agencies, and um, a lot of our work is focused on what we must do to develop a clear and predictable framework of rules that uh, are the function and the product of, again, collaboration with a mutual commitment to maximizing the potential of space and, and also to ensure that America's leadership continues to be what it has been, which is a source of inspiration for people around the world. Uh, there is so much about our, our spirit in this regard that has been always collaborative and has been motivated um, by what we can do for the benefit of all people. Uh, so this is uh, work that will continue, and it is an excellent um, reason why we have the National Space Council to continue this kind of collaborative work and working together to coordinate as well within the United States government. So my final request is that um, council members provide me with a proposal for the authorization and supervision of commercial novel space activities within 180 days. and. What I'd ask is that your proposals include how we will ensure space operations abide by space safety norms and protocols, as has been discussed this afternoon. And with that, I thank everyone. I thank our panelists. I thank everyone who has participated in this afternoon's convening. Uh, before we conclude, I will also announce the new chair of the National Space Council's User Advisory Group. Uh, and that is General Les Lyles, and he has a long history of public service. Many of you have probably worked with him, including 35 years of service in the United States Air Force and leading the NASA Advisory Council. His perspective is uh, extraordinary in terms of the work he has done across multiple sectors. And while he is unable to join us today, I look forward to working with him and um, his leadership. I also want to thank Admiral J uh, Jim Ellis as the outgoing chair for his service to our nation and his leadership of the UAG. And soon we will release the names of the other members of our user advisory group. But with that, I will thank everyone for your ongoing work and your commitment for all you do, everyone here to inspire our exploration and our involvement in space. And with that, I wish you all a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. We are going. The history of this agency is marked with broken barriers, once viewed as impossible, with science fiction turned